Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimont, for this presentation with Fabrizio Lanza. Um, as you know, uh, Italy and Italian, uh, Italians are in general associated with food, sometimes in very uh, unflattering ways. And some people think that we should not talk about food because it's a trivial topic. Uh, well, at Casa Italiana, we think that you can talk about food in a variety of different ways. And one way in which you can talk about food is with intelligence and culture and making it part of the cultural discourse that regards it. And we believe that it's exactly what Fabrizia Lanza has been doing over the years and that's why it's a great pleasure to welcome her uh, to the casa. I can see that from, from your presence, food is still a big appeal. <laughs> Sicily might be an even bigger appeal. And saints and rituals and traditions might add to the whole thing. So I, I'm delighted that you're here with us to share uh, in this event. Uh, we had the fortune that uh, with Fabrizio Lanza on our stage, we had David Tanis. He is the author of two best-selling cookbooks, The Platter of Figs and Other Recipes, and Part of the Artichoke and Other Kitchen Journeys. He is a longtime chef at Chez Panisse, and he currently writes uh, for the weekly uh, column City Kitchen for the New York Times. Uh, David will come and tell you something more about Fabrizio that he visited also at Casavecchia, at her estate in Sicily. Uh, and Fabrizio will give her a presentation with illustrations and images. And after that, we'll have a chance to have a little brindisi, a toast with the wines produced uh, by Fabrizio. And uh, there are books for sales upstairs, and Fabrizio will be happy to sign them for you at the end of the event. And we set up to ask David Tanis to please come and tell us something more about Fabrizio. Thank you all for being here. topic. <laughs> I'll just start out by saying that. Uh, and it's uh, lovely to have you all here uh, because you're going to see a nice uh, uh, show and uh, it's lovely to be able to celebrate uh, Fabrizio's uh, new cookbook. Uh, I'll just tell you a few things that I know about Fabrizio uh, and uh, uh, I'll leave you to uh, uh, Fabrizio's story. Um, I have worked for many years as a professional chef, but really my, my passion is home cooking, and my passion is rustic cooking more than uh, fancy food. Um, so uh, to be able to visit uh, Casavecchia and Regaliale in the, in the beautiful valley out there outside of Palermo, it was for me, uh, I, I've been to visit several times now, Basically, I want to go live there. <laughs> uh, or at least I want to go and be a slave. <laughs> uh, I was there uh, uh, a couple of months ago, well, in, in August, because I was, uh, well, Fabrizio said, you must come in the summertime. I only had visited in, in cold weather. It's beautiful every time of year, but uh, in the summertime, it's true. It's, uh, uh, it's a little more pleasant. Uh, she said, you must come and see us make the estrato, the sun-dried tomato paste. Uh, so I was excited to go do that this year. Uh, but it was one of the hottest summers in Sicily, and so uh, everything came right uh, two weeks earlier than it, was, uh, uh, than it ever had before. So by the time I got there, estrato was already finished. But they were already making the salsa di pomodoro, so I got to watch and help uh, make uh, 300 kilos of tomatoes <laughs> into some beautiful uh, tomato sauce. And I spent uh, many hours in the gardens there. Um, beautiful vegetable garden, beautiful situation. Um, 
And uh, first the whole concept of cooking from garden uh, to table uh, is the most wonderful thing. Uh, to be able to go out into the garden and pick the salad just before dinner, uh, to pick the tomatoes that you're going to eat, never, uh, the, uh, these vegetables never see uh, the inside of a refrigerator because they just come straight to the kitchen. And the flavor is, as you can imagine, uh, uh, incredible. Um, so if you get the chance, you must go uh, and visit. Uh, in the meantime, you have the beautiful book, uh, which uh, paints a very realistic picture, I think, of, uh, of what's happening there. Uh, and it's, uh, it's actually extraordinary. Uh, uh, because there are so many people involved uh, in, in making the, the place run. Uh, of course, uh, Fabrizio uh, took the school over uh, uh, from her mother, Anna, Anna Tasca Lanza, um, uh, a few years ago, and she's now making uh, strides in beginning to make it a, a little more of her own project. Uh, but uh, Anna did wonderful things. Uh, uh, basically, in, in, in preserving and identifying uh, the, the Sicilian uh, traditions uh, that are dying out. Um, and that's, uh, I, I, I believe, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, Fabrizio's talent, because not only is she a wonderful natural cook, and I, I love to say that because Fabrizio is not a chef, she is a wonderful natural cook, and it's probably a better thing to be a wonderful natural cook than it is to be a, a chef at a restaurant. Um, but she's also a poet, an artist, a historian, an anthropologist, and above all, uh, an adventurer. Uh, so I think she's doing very, very important work. Uh, um, and Sicily is such a special place, so different from the rest of Italy, with so many influences and such history, uh, that to find little pockets uh, of the kinds of dishes that have been made in a certain area uh, for years and years, uh, uh, this needs a, it, it needs to be documented. Uh, uh, the younger generation maybe is interested, maybe is not, but there's going to be another generation that one day will be interested. And I think uh, um, uh, it's fascinating, actually, to see a lot of the dishes um, that uh, Fabrizio makes at home. Uh, they're real, and they come from the earth, but they also have uh, a fascinating history. I'm going to let uh, Fabrizio tell you the story. So please welcome. Thank you. thank you. Thank you all for being here and thank you David for these wonderful words. It's, you could have continued. <laughs> um, well, yes, uh, I, I must say that my approach to food is slightly different. I am a home cook. I've always cooked all my life, but I actually had a first career before having a cooking school as a museum curator. So I was, uh, I'm, I'm officially trained as an art historian. And I think that this, um, I think in life for everyone, uh, everything turns out to be useful in some way. So I think that uh, what I'm doing nowadays on cooking, on preserving, on talking and thinking about food is definitely mixed up with my what I've been studying and what was my first career. Um, I will start by, uh, I have a very short PowerPoint because half of it went blank this morning, I don't know why, but I'm not great in techniques. So I will do a very short PowerPoint just showing you what are, uh, where I am, where, what we do, uh, how is this cooking school started, and uh, which is, uh, what is our mission mainly. And then um, you will have to um, give a look to this very short movie, that, uh, this short documentary that I made when I started 
when I started working with my mother, which was six years ago, uh, I, I actually came back to Sicily, as the book says. I was uh, doing my art historian work in the north of Italy, so I came back to Sicily. And uh, um, what happened is that I, I had missed from Sicily for 25 years, so it was really a coming back. And I was simply uh, overwhelmed by the beauty, the senses, the, the colors, the flavors, the people, the things that I had inside, but I had sort of closed out of my life for 25 years. And uh, so what I did was uh, I, I bought a very simple, the simplest video camera I could find, and I started filming. So you have to forgive the naivete and the ingenuity of my little documentary, but I think this is uh, um, very loyal to what my feelings were and are still are towards these incredible traditions. And it looks like uh, something, some kind of uh, adventure happened in the 70s or in the 60s while it was done six years ago. <laughs> so well, let's start with this. Um, now, I always start with this map, which I hope is still here. <laughs> Maybe it needs some time. Anyway, Sissy. <laughs> It was working this afternoon, so I hope it will. Um, when my mother started the, her cooking school, which was in 1989, uh, she immediately started, uh, she came off to the States. I mean, she, she had this opportunity. Um, a friend of her, Lorenza Stucchi, who had a cooking school in the north of Italy, in Tuscany, suggested she would, should start this business. So she arrived here and she used to go at these big cooking conventions uh, with all the people involved in food. And her major frustration was every time she started talking about the school and Sicily, that people would say, oh, wonderful, where is it? And so nobody knew much about Sicily except for the godfather and mafia and these horrible things. And uh, nobody really knew where Sicily was. So the second time she went, she said, I, well, this time I wrote a map. So every time somebody would say something, she would stick her finger and say, this is where we are. Now, this should have been a map. <laughs> and uh, mm, I think it's important because geography really has a lot of consequences in the life of a country. And Sicily is right in the middle. So all the movement that came was was working and was going on uh, since before Christ and after Christ until the Middle Ages was going from east to west and they all Phoenicians, Egyptians, Moorish, they all bumped into Sicily sooner or later. And on the other side, when later on in Renaissance and after the Middle Ages, people came from Spain and from French, again, they all bumped into Sicily. And Sicily, since it was at that time, and still is in part, uh, what Homer used to say as a garden of asperities, of beauties, of uh, fresh vegetables, of wonderful fruits, people would not only bump in it, but would stay. So as a matter of fact, Sicily is an incredible um, reservoir of tradition. Ah, here it is. I just had to... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Sicily is, as a matter of fact, an uh, incredible reservoir of, uh, of traditions, of layers of different cultures. And I must say that besides temples and uh, churches and paintings and mosaics, in the food you actually have, still have, a blend of flavors which recall to different countries around the Mediterranean area. Now, uh, we are right in the middle of Sicily. This is where my mother, uh, years ago, in 1989, started this cooking school. Uh, the cooking school is within a family estate called the Regaliani. 
where my grandfather, you see on the right, and my grandmother started the winery Tasca del Merita, and you will taste this evening one of our wines. Uh, my grandfather started this wine, he had a big nose, so he wanted to use this big nose, and it was a very good wine, and he actually managed to do that. And he started this winery around the 70s. You know that wine was a big issue in Sicily because we had great problems in temperature control. It's a very warm country and uh, uh, sugar, the, 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 the grapes have a very high sugar content, so it's not easy with this warm to control fermentation. So finally he got over this problem and he started this business with this slogan, which was in the 70s, really very pioneeristic, a farm versus a family. Now this is very common nowadays because everybody is uh, pictured from uh, Buitoni on, uh, like big families and hugging grandfathers and little nieces and so on. But at that time it was really quite new. And this is my grandfather with my grandmother and my mother in their arms. Uh, later on my mother would become um, I would say really the first um, ambassador of Sicilian cuisine in the U.S. I mean, she was uh, quite uh, quite extraordinary. In this. She had really a talent in uh, explaining what food and how the food uh, was in Sicily. And unfortunately, she passed away two years ago. And I had the fortune to join her. Uh, six years ago, so I managed to follow her in this adventure for uh, a few years and, uh, and now I took over. Nowadays, uh, we are all the family. We, I mean, I have my cooking school, my mother's cooking school in this old house called Casa Vecchia. And, uh, and there is, uh, it is within this very large property, it's 550 hectares, uh, mostly grapes. And uh, on this property, there is another major house where the winery is. And as uh, Sicilian rules uh, ask for, the men are in charge of the wine and the women of the cooking. So I am on the cooking school, while my uncle, who is uh, actually the owner of the winery, and his two sons, Giuseppe and Alberto, are in charge of the winery. Uh, luckily, we love each other because this is. <laughs> And so we work a lot together and we have absolutely very similar goals. And uh, this is what I may need to talk to you about is these three big words that mean a lot and, uh, to us. One is sustainability, which is a much wider concept than organic. I mean, you need to be sustainable uh, in a much why the sense, uh, I mean, if you don't throw uh, pesticides on a grape and then you use six motor cars to go and collect these grapes, it's not much the point. So uh, we tend to work on the field and myself on my garden in a mo trying to be the most correct towards the soil, towards the land, towards the workers and make everything combine in a in a, in a good way. Uh, promotion, this is another big, uh, big theme for us because we believe that um, we can't grow ourselves, so we can't improve our business if the whole context around us doesn't have some beneficial effect and doesn't interact with our business. So Sicily is a very difficult country from this point of view. There's, yeah. it's, it's, it's backwards. I mean, it, it, people are uh, in the countryside um, don't speak properly Italian. I mean, they're very, they're quite rustic, I would say. Mm -hmm. So uh, to work on this context, it's it's quite an issue, but it's absolutely important because you can't just be an island in a desert. So you need to interact with the people. So we have a lot of. Uh, all the workers that work for us come from the nearby villages and uh, we do workshop and farmers market inviting all the small producers in the area and, um, and finally preservation, this is what I'm mostly concerned 
um, as uh, David was saying before, I, I'm definitely interested in food. I like eating, like many of us, but uh, the recipe is really the, the end of the story, and I'm much more interested in, in what is behind the recipe than in the recipe itself. And so, as I said before, uh, when I started doing this job, I started uh, filming, recording, interviewing, and I can tell you that Sicily is really, really a continent from this point of view. I mean, this, every little village has their own stories, their own recipes, their own ways of doing things. And in fact, I am building up a video archive on those different techniques on ha on, of, of handling s certain doughs or certain pastas or certain pizza or whatever you want to talk about because I'm unfortunately convinced that in 10, 15 years this will be probably vanished. People don't have time there like they don't have time here and the kids of these old ladies who still prepare their own foods their only desire is to have a huge McDonald's with a wonderful coat. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that this is it. So we start by respecting the soil. Now, uh, we have a very, very healthy soil. It's not volcanic, but it's a soil made out of lots of clay and sand, which is uh, particularly uh, good for, for grapes and for tomatoes, as, uh, as uh, we were saying before. And uh, so we avoid pesticide, we avoid anything that could harm the soil, and we respect, um, uh, I have no idea how you say this in English, it's a, it's a way of um, changing crops every year in order to... Rotation. 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 Rotation, exactly. Crop rotation in order to nourish with nitrogen and then change. So we provide uh, for the essential, so this farm is actually nearly totally self-sufficient except for the salt. I haven't managed to bring the sea up, as a, but maybe one day. Uh, so we cheese, olives and grapes and this is, as you can imagine, the staple of any Mediterranean country. Wine, bread and olive oil. Uh, we have about 3,000 plants of uh, olives on olive trees on the, on the property and we make our olive oil and we actually harvest it. I, I always tend to show this picture because this is exactly how, um, how a man picking olives is depicted on, on an Athenian uh, vase of the 5th century before Christ, so there's not a great difference. They didn't have these sticks with Teflon with plastic fingers at the end, but basically the concept was exactly the same. So we gently uh, use these um, cones to pull down the olives. The olives are collected on a, on a net on the floor and then immediately harvested because as you may, may know, uh, one of the principles of having good olive oil is to press the olives as soon as they're picked, so no, not letting them sit. And finally, uh, we cure them, and this is also a picture I'm very fond of, because we cure them exactly like a picho says in one of his recipe books. And uh, here we are a bit later, it's after Christ, and it's, uh, this is, these are green olives. In, uh, kept in brine and covered with wild fennel. So who, some of you probably have been to Sicily and know that wild, wild fennel is very different from the, from the bulb that you normally farm and it's a wheat that grows on our mountains and we make, with this wheat we make a lot of food and basically pasta con le sarde, which is one of the staples of our diet. <laughs> Food is grapes, obviously. The land is covered, this, this property is covered with grapes. We, we produce three million bottles of grape, uh, of uh, wine, so it's quite big. And most of it is harvested, only 20% of it is harvested with machinery, but uh, the rest of it is all harvested by hand. And then cheese. The cheese making is still done 
um, in a very, very traditional way. As you can see, the pot is uh, uh, s sitting in a hole, so the pot is actually the double what you see. And then the fire is set under, and usually the fuel used for this hot fire is uh, made with olive pits. So you see there is this whole, uh, let's say, reusing and uh, never wasting things. So this is very important in the country. I mean, it's not just a, a matter of marketing. It's really the way people live over there and the way they've been doing this for centuries. This is pecorino that we make, aged. And this is the salt. I had to put this picture, although it has nothing to do with us, but this is, um, I think, I believe, one of the most gorgeous places in Sicily. It's called Mozia. It's a Phoenician colony uh, where they harvest by hand the sea salt. And you see these little big mountains are mountains of salt, and it's really an amazing uh, scenery, uh, a sort of a mixture of a Dutch landscape with African light, so it's quite quite extraordinary. Mystery. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, and this is again more uh, about this uh, um, traditional ways of farming. This, this is a field of lentils, and we still farm them as it was done, which means letting dry the plant on the, on the fields, um, taking off the plant actually with the roots from the fields, letting it dry, and then waving in the air the straws in order to get the pots falling on the ground. And obviously you have to choose a day with no wind, otherwise it would be quite complicated. <laughs> and this is the far harvesting of wild fennel that we do regularly every winter. Uh, we, this is the moment where, we, where we, the wild fennel is at its best, and we harvest it, and we, we, we clean it, and we boil it, and we freeze it to have it the rest of the year. This is different kinds of greens that I grow in the garden, all that you can harvest up in the mountains. And finally, yes, um, I wanted to, yes, just, very briefly say uh, that um, all of this, um, it's not uh, a cooking school that was born yesterday and that started doing these trendy things like the uh, farm to table movement and all this. This has been done since ever. And, uh, and I must say that when I joined all this and I started doing this, I realized how much um, how much, um, how, how patient and how intense and what a different schedule and time people had when you work on the land. I mean, when you eat a, a, a dish of peas and you think how much, how much time it took to collect, to harvest these peas and then peel them and then cook them, you get a different sense of what nature can give you, what you can give to nature, and what you get back, and, and the, whole, the whole story. Uh, one of the most uh, intense labors, as, um, as um, Davis was telling you about, is this huge tomato festival we do in summer. This was done before, until 20 years ago, was done by any housekeeper in Sicily. You would see in August the little yards covered with red, whatever, roofs, yards, terraces, they were all covered with red and you would have people uh, collecting and um, drying their own tomatoes or cooking for tomato sauce. Here we are doing the sun-dried tomatoes and this is how we do our, what I call the Sicilian beluga, which is basically a uh, tomato paste, nothing to do with the tomato paste you have here. This is a, a tomato sauce which is uh, um, dried out on wooden tables for three days and stirred continuously in order to avoid the crust. The sun is so warm that it would immediately make a sort of a little crust on top and you would have mold in the, in the part under, under, the, under the crust. So in order to avoid this and have it all drying evenly, you have to stir it every half an hour. Wow. And at the end of this, you get a very, very thick paste. Mm -hmm. wow. 
and uh, which is our um, how would you say our bouillon cube somehow <laughs> it's uh, it's a natural a natural uh, ve uh, vegetarian um, and flavor and chance. Do you say this? You say it this way? Huh? An answer. So we use this a lot in soups and stews, and it's um, very, very ancient. It was probably the first way tomatoes were eaten in uh, in the south of Italy because uh, it was a way to preserve. Once you've done this and you've cooked it in the sun, this can last for ages. And uh, it was the way uh, people would season their meats or, or their pastas. You know, the tomato was used after a long, long time before, after the discovery. I mean, it was considered poisonous. So it took, it took a couple of centuries before people had the pasta with tomato sauce. This is uh, uh, the tomato bottles that uh, David was talking to you about. And these are different other places. Other uh, um, works that I, I don't want to I don't want to <coughs> abuse of your patience, but this is at the end what I discovered looking at all this that um, this strange slow rhythm that the countryside and that the country producing poses you uh, in some way blends with a with a religious attitude in some way still in Sicily I mean. Uh, um, every every special date is uh, is a date that has to do with the birth of a season and the birth of a saint. It has to do with a celebration, and the celebration has always to do with food. So there's a very interesting blend between uh, uh, religious <coughs> festivities and food. You also have to consider that in the countryside. Uh, the big difference between a festive day and every day was starvation against food. I mean, the festive day was the day people used to eat finally. And uh, so, uh, since we are um, a culture that has so deep, so deeply rooted in uh, um, in an agrarian calendar, uh, each change of seasoning, each moment of harvest or of seeding or of pruning in some way dedicated to a god or a saint. And this is very, very sensible in Sicily. It's, uh, um, you go for a St. Joseph feast or a St. Lucy's feast or St. Calodro. Each village has their own, their own festival. And it's always somehow thanking somebody for the harvest or for the food you got. And obviously, wheat has the main part. Uh, now, where I have my family's estate is now a big patch of green. We have lots of vines, and <coughs> as you as you understood, but it was mainly wheat. So it's quite unusual compared to the rest of uh, to the surrounding. That part of Sicily was the granary of the empire. I mean, it was the best uh, grain and wheat that the Roman Empire would harvest and would provide for the soldiers and for the Roman population. And it was mainly durum wheat, which is the wheat that you use for making pasta. <laughs> ah, ecco. This is effetti speciali. And uh, so a little bit of a Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> And uh, so this is how actually the landscape looks in this part of Sicily. It's, it's quite amazing because you have no houses. Uh, it's a completely moon, moon landscape. And uh, this is, uh, it has also very deep historical reasons because this was Latifundia, huge, huge properties were in this side of the island. So you would have one main house and then lots and lots of land and all of this land is mainly wheat well you can understand without me telling too much this is a uh, different <laughs> consequences of wheat and um, and finally yes these are the traditional 
uh, celebration breads. And so we are finally coming at the short movie I'm going to show you this uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, as I said, this is a traditional kudura. Kudura is a, is a very general word in Sicilian. In kuduriare means to uh, roll up. And in fact, these breads are always sort of round. And again, you see that what this lady is shaping on top of the bread is a sort of a song of spring. So there's leaves, there's little birds, there's little flowers. And this is uh, one of the bread that is done for St. Joseph's feet. And it's, uh, which falls on the 19th of March, which is actually the passing between winter and spring. So the movie we're going to see, the short documentary we're going to see now, is exactly a sort of a celebration that the um, private women do in their own house uh, in order to, a sort of a banquet, to uh, a propitiatory banquet in order to hope for the next harvest. So it's the ending of winter, it's the finishing of all the food that has been stored in the winter in the hope that the spring will bring new new food. This is another ritual bread that is done with uh, for Easter. It's an Easter bread, uh, Pupico Lova, and this is done all over Sicily. It's basically a bread baked with an egg. Of course, the egg is highly symbolic of a rebirth, of, uh, of a starting again. And these are breads, again, made for St. Joseph. This was, uh, I, I, I took pictures of this in a small, uh, awful place called Ramarca. Uh, I mean, awful because this is one of the contradictions of Sicily. I mean, it's awfully polluted from an uh, architectural point of view. People have no care. They build ugly houses. You have all these houses with iron sticking up because they are unfinished. They are unfinished and they're waiting the government to forgive them for this awfully thing to build another layer on top of that. But on the other side, when you get into the houses, they do this. So there's this completely crazy mixture. And this, uh, these are the breads done for St. Joseph. So that's St. Joseph's beard. <laughs> This is, uh, you don't quite read it because these, I took pictures of these breads unbaked, so they, they, they don't, they've been, they've risen, so they've lost a little bit of the shape. But this is the two hands of the Madonna uh, embracing, so it's, a, it's an embrace and it's a, it represents uh, Mary, while this is a rooster and represents Christ. This is one of the tables. Um, table for St. Joseph, and um, it's very ritual. So they organize, they choose uh, the largest room in their house, and, um, and they set up an altar, literally an altar. And this altar is completely covered with food. And you have all these breads that are representative of the story of St. Joseph. And then what's mo mostly important, they have all the first how would you say primizie in English? The fresh produce of uh, the first salad, the first citron, the first oranges, because it's important to show that it's a new beginning. So, uh, and every part of the table is set for a kid who will come and eat this. So it's quite, uh, it's quite gorgeous. And this is another St. Joseph table taken in another, in another village called Salemi. And all these little bits and pieces that you see are breads. They're all made out of bread. And, um, and so there's, there's not only, as I said, patience and labor. There's a lot of uh, faith. Uh, I mean, the women work on this for weeks before the big celebration. And the way they work, they gather together all the family of the, of the women of the families and they talk and they chat and they compare. It's a huge social event besides the religion, besides the faith, besides the pleasure. Because obviously all this goes together with pleasure. So I think it's the moment to see this little movie because that explains quite a lot. I hope I'm doing the right thing. 
I've been told I have to do ask. <coughs> so I will do like this. And, uh, ah, echo. Maybe everything will work. So. Siamo? Sì, è partito.
so the oven is stoked to raise the temperatures and allow the bread to rise. Concetta mixes the dough into two batches of 20 kilos each. The bread is handled all the way above, according to a newborn baby. The dough is mixed quickly and rhythmically with strong arms. Conchetta's mother and sister-in-law help, and they use their whole bodies to stir the dough. The kneading, too, is done quickly, because the dough is now alive and can get out of hand, rising too much. <laughs> the three shapes that depict the Holy Family in Mirabella are the beard of San Giuseppe, the virgin with her hands crossed on her breast, and the rooster, who represents Jesus. Almost all of the shapes into which the bread is molded are traditional ones, made without forms and using only a few utensils, such as a fork and pitchers, and they may take only animal, plant, floral, or geometric shapes. Many of these shapes are very ancient, dating back to agrarian cults of the Neolithic period. They are found in many other parts of Sicily. Elsewhere, the bread shapes may represent the saint's tools, such as a saw, pinchers, or hammer. Parts of his body, such as the hand or beard, symbols of the passion of Christ, a spear, nails, a stick with a sponge, a ladder, or depictions of symbolic fruits or animals, such as the grape, the rooster, or fish. At Romaca, the symbolic shapes include a flowered branch, a braid, and a beard, as well as large kudure with floral patterns. On these forms grow flowers, sprigs of wheat and fruits, and these are symbols of the natural world in all its abundance. When the bread is risen, it is brushed with eggs and baked. The period of baking is experienced as a rite of waiting, patience, and reflection. When finally the great golden kudure, weighing nearly seven to eight kilos each, are baked, they are ready to go on the altar. <laughs> on the sixth, seventh, and eighth days, working even harder and faster, the women prepare the food that must be eaten fresh. The little pastries, called casatelle, are filled with sweet chickpeas and vino cotto, which is reduced to green must. These are a specialty of Mirabella, and they are complicated to make, because firstly, the chickpeas must be boiled until soft, sweetened with sugar and vino cotto, and finally wrapped and fried along with the Sfinche of San Giuseppe, only one day before the altar is unveiled. The preparation of the tables and plates, which is done bit by bit over the week, is also of great importance. Each plate must be calibrated in portions. Three portions, three and three, plus one that will be divided among the saints at the moment of the ceremony. Thus, three pieces of broccoli, will be offered along with one piece, to divide in three, to be eaten. The table will be decorated with linen from the bride's dowry, and the images must be chosen with care, and only orange blossoms and bay branches are used. <coughs> Plants that symbolize the rebirth of nature in spring, like we find in the staff of San Giuseppe in the church at Santa Croce Camerina. consumed by the three protagonists of the ceremony, representing Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, as well as by all those who wish to participate. The meal begins with blamage, a milk pudding of medieval origins offered at the feast of San Giuseppe, because it was meant to break the Lenten fast and prepare the stomach for what followed. 
The lady of the house then has the saints taste all the food offered at the table, beginning with antipasti, then pasta with fava and other beans, and the macu, a ceremonial minestrone made of whole dry fava beans. This last dish symbolizes the consumption of the last seeds left over from the winter in the hopes that spring will bring a rebirth making the saints fertile along with all the other members of the family and the household, including, once upon a time, even the animals who were given to that coup to taste. The symbolism of the holy breads and the ceremony certainly reflect Christian rites. At the same time, however, it is evident that there are elements mixed into the San Giuseppe ritual that hark back to a pre-Christian belief. <coughs> the egg, for example, the cosmic symbol par excellence for ancient agrarian societies, is divided among the three saints at the beginning of the meal, as if to signify that the banquet has a cosmological significance. The egg is the world because it is full, Celestina tells us. The three panunzi, called by some umundo, or the world, suggest the universe as well as the mystery of the Trinity. Celestina <coughs> offers these to the saints with great symbolic care, making sure to cut them precisely without turning them over or stabbing them with a knife, which would be sacrilegious. Finally, at the end of the meal, when the huge cakes have been cut, and all has been distributed, the great kudure are given to the saints. These sacred breads, to which family and friends have attached money for the children, are given out along with the traditional fuga carne, biscuit, made in Ramaka. Yeah. Oh, my bad again. Yeah. I have to, I 
can't say many more words in Italian, but... <laughs> Do you have any questions or curiosity? Yes? I just wonder if you know that the uh, practice of uh, uh, San Giuseppe Day with exactly those breads and tables is maintained in New Orleans. I know. Very, and Mobile, Alabama. And they do most of the tables in the churches and take ads in the local papers to tell people at which places they can see the St. Joseph's table. And they yes. do the exact same breads with the, with the knives and yeah. the bread. Yes, I, I, I knew this. I have never seen them, but I have, um, I have got, uh, people send me photos of this. Yes, I know this. It's quite extraordinary that, especially, often people from far away preserve even more intensely the traditions because they are missing them. But what about San Giuseppe in this area? Is it celebrated? Uh, in New York, I don't know. Yes, yes. yes. I think bakeries have seen you to San Giuseppe and some of the breads in the cake. But I don't know if there are local churches that do the table. The Church of St. Joseph here, San Giuseppe, uh -huh. yeah. Stanley, still has one. Uh -huh. They still do it like a reduced version, but it's of course inspired by the tradition of the Sicilian immigrants. Yeah. You're on Sixth Avenue and, and uh, Waverly Place. I should come here for the 19th one. <laughs> yes? Sorry, the old Sicilian bakery in Bayside, it's the St. Joseph's Day, the lines are out the door. Ah. All day long. Wow. Mm -hmm. We have a tradition in our family that we still do it here in New York. We go to different, every year somebody does the altar in the house, the food, and invites the people. Exactly the way, not as extraordinary as that one, but very close to that. And you advise, who do you offer this table to? People uh, just to well, what it, uh, You invite usually, like, it has to be kids. Usually they're kids that are yes. invited. And they get to take all the stuff home, like they said, the money, and then they give them the wine, the cheese, the fruit. It's very similar to that, not as elaborate as that, but we keep the tradition going here. Yes. Because there are, in fact, in Sicily, different variations on this theme. In this place where I went to do the film, <coughs> the invitation was for three, the three poorest ki children of the village. Why, where I am, in Vallelunga, they invite 12 up to 24 little kids that were called virginetti, which means virgins. Now, no. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, this different uh, different ways. Yes, Ms. Elaine? I came a little late, so I didn't hear whether you had mentioned what part of Sicily your whole estate is. My whole estate is uh, in the middle of Sicily. So it's in the middle of Sicily. My estate is in the middle of Sicily near Caltanissetta. Is that Catania? No, Catania is on the other side of Sicily. Oh. It's south Palermo towards the middle. Okay. My father is from Messina, uh -huh. so I, would that be at the same? Uh, no. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> Myself? Yes. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, what sort of yeast is used to, uh, for the bread? For the bread, it's used a sourdough. A sourdough. Yeah, oh. they make the, that. The, when you saw the, her uh, sort of taking this big batch of um, of. It looked like bread, it looked like a, a dough, but that was a sourdough. And then she melts it in, a, in, among, in the flour where she has the big uh, maida, that's the shape, it's called maida, and she puts all the flour, and then she's melting the sourdough with the water. But, but then it's covered with white poppy seeds, is it? Correct? Yeah. Yeah. The little white yes. poppy seeds. Yes. In Sicily, we have breads either with sesame seeds or with poppy seeds. Traditional also in the families in this Well, sourdough was the only way to make bread until mm -hmm. they didn't invent the compressed yeast or the dried yeast. Mm -hmm. so bread was made like this. Yes, because you said it's so hot, then how is the sourdough kept? Uh, Very sour. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yes? I'm just wondering how uh, important, if at all, are the two vegetables that uh, we eat here in the United States, broccoli rabe and uh, eggplant, Yes. as part of the Sicilian. I always say that eggplant is to Sicily like potato is to Ireland. <laughs> It is that important. And broccoli also very much. Uh, broccoli rabi is a bitter taste. Uh, we call them sparacelli and they're very sweet. They're not so bitter, no. The uh, ministry and uh, the savory dishes or the bread, are they served at different times of the year or are they only served for that festival? No, then people do yeah. eat them, but yeah. Then are they in some way coated because you orient it if you are given that Fava bean soup that you really know that it's no 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 the fava bean you eat it anyway it's a it's a we the, the the diet in Sicily is very much based on legumes we eat a lot of legumes so fava's peas uh, um, there's an old legume called cicerchia which is disappearing you know it. Mm -hmm. huh. Very rare, and uh, no, fowl is used a lot. Oh, I understand that, but I guess the question would be, are the, is it, if I have that in July, do I have an association to that? No. Okay. Yes? Um, I've eaten in Italian homes where the kitchens were extremely primitive, and the, and the food was spectacular. Yes, yes. And I've eaten in American homes that were so <laughs> tech, but you had a knife for every single purpose, and the food is what the Italians might call schifets. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if the Sicilians have succumbed to this mania. Because in the good kitchens, there was a one sharp knife, and that was high tech. That was like, yes, we don't, we're not very high-tech in Sicily. And I can tell you that in Sicily, my opinion is that you eat very badly in restaurants because the cooking in homes is so high quality <laughs> that people don't go out. But you make a very good point that, that a kitchen doesn't need much more than no. fire, water, and a knife. And uh, uh, a lot of people with fancy kitchens uh, who don't know how to cook would, would sort of do well to understand this concept. Yeah. They don't even read the instructions about <laughs> <how to> <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned when you made usual picture of making cheese and you said you use the olive pits yes. as, as fuel. Um, are those required to dry for a certain amount of time before you can no. actually use them? At the no. Industry? Well, of course, if you use them as soon as you've pressed the olive, they, they wouldn't work. Are they compressed into a... Uh, no, 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 no. We use uh, either olive pits or um, the shells of the almonds. Fabrizio, tell, tell more about the cheese making at, at Regaliale. Yeah. It's so interesting. It is very interesting, yes. It's, um, but now it's, uh, it's hidden because with the EU laws, it's very difficult to make cheese nowadays. I mean, you have to have a sparkling white room and the sheets have to be dressed with a tie and <laughs> <laughs> very, very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> but um, so we make our ricotta but we hiding and, uh, and it's made it's made you know that ricotta is not technically a cheese because it's made with a leftover whey. Uh, so we make this uh, cheese that's called Tuma, which is the, the first cheese that curls <coughs> up once you put the rennet in the milk. And then with the leftover whey, nothing is wasted. It's in, this, in this way, you know, the thing is really gorgeous to see the whole process because everything has a purpose. Every, nothing is wasted. So you have this huge pot, as you saw in the movie, and uh, the fire is under. So they don't bring the milk to a boil, but they bring it around 45 degrees. And then it started curdling, and you know that the rennet is the stomach of the lamb that has never eaten uh, nothing else than, than the milk of the mother. So it's a clean stomach. And uh, it, so the, the milk curdles, and the cheese comes rising up, so the, the, the shepherd starts collecting this big batches of cheese and pressing it and put it in little baskets that once were of straw and now they're plastic, unfortunately. And then he collects all the leftover whey and he puts it back again on the fire and with a certain amount of salt and a little add 
not more than 20% of milk, bringing it back to 30, 30, uh, 75 degrees Celsius. It curdles again and you get ricotta. And the ricotta in Sicily, how is ricotta in Sicily? This is the best ricotta you have ever tasted. Yes, I mean, you, you were dying to have it actually. <laughs> it's really very special. So is it something that's only made in the spring because that's on the land? No, the, actually ricotta is made nearly all year round, but the real ricotta is made from, uh, let's say now, from November until May until the pastures are green. Then there is a moment where the sheep are not milked because they need to feed the lambs. And then there is a moment where they don't have a lot of uh, pastures because the fields are yellow, they're burned. So that's, let's say, in summer, some farms still make ricotta, but they mix it up with cow milk. But the pure sheep milk is basically in winter. Are there any uh, genuine Sicilian uh, restaurants in New York. Canada. That's a terrible question. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yes, there is one called Aolo. Aolo. It's a fantastic It is? I'm going to go there tonight. Where, and where is it? It's on uh, 7th Avenue between 20, 20th and 21st. Okay, good. It's, good. Nobody knows about it. It's, it's really good. She's Sicilian, so she can testify. She's been also at the cooking school, so she knows. I rely. Hatch of Vino, I know that one. Yes, yeah. So? I know only Hatch of Vino. I cooked over there once, many years ago. It's totally changed now. Ah, it's changed? In better? Uh, yeah, aesthetically, yes. The quality is very high. Could we just ask for those names of places? <laughs> <laughs> what, what we're going to do for this, uh, I'm going to post a, a photograph of Fabrizia and David on our Facebook page, and you're welcome to add your suggestions of good Sicilian restaurants in New York. Yeah. So they don't feel obliged to vouch for them since they're not trying. <laughs> okay. Okay. And Fabrizia, also a question. Regarding, you just mentioned about the, the sheep with ties. Yes. and the rules of the yeah. European Union. And one of the fascinating things about Sicilian cuisine is the variety. Yeah. Like the, you don't have one kind of eggplant. No. You have one kind of yeah. tomatoes. Yeah. And this is a huge problem on, on the world scale, the reduction of the variety of plants, because we tend to go and buy the tomatoes, and that's all we have yeah, in a huge supermarket. And what you were saying about uh, the rules of the EU, that on one hand they're useful to ensure certain standards of, of uh, cleanliness, uh, food safety, and so on, but at the same time they really are, are imposing certain rules that are impossible to follow in small uh, productions. How, how is, are those rules of the EU affecting the variety of produce and products? that is so typical uh, of uh, Sicilian cuisine, and that's one of the, the characteristics that make, make it great. Well, I must say that cheese is a special issue, because you have milk, you have this uh, uh, raw milk and all this story. I mean, cheese is a very <coughs> special issue. And I'm, I'm a bit conflicted on this, because on, in some ways it's true that this um, uh, EU requirements are very difficult to handle for shepherds, for people who have a very small produce. But on the other side, I must say that in, in some parts of Sicily more evolved, and in the rest of Italy, I mean, they've managed to work out this. So it's also something that is very anti-Sicilian, that people should gather together and try and fix these things together and understand and maybe hire somebody who would translate EU laws <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's also a matter of going over things because, I mean, some things are correct. On the other and, and if you really want something, you can, you can make it, I think. It, so, I mean, these laws are a bit severe in some ways, but they also fall in a context that is 
incredibly primitive and happy to be primitive, which is the worst part. I mean, they won't move of an inch, this shepherd. If you tell him, why don't you adjust this and that, he will just go off. <laughs> so, uh, well, but apart from the cheese issue, there is quite a wide variety of, of, of different kinds of vegetables, uh, more so than, uh, uh, do, you th do you find that changing as well? Well, that is the changing. Yes, it is changing because, uh, uh, for example, we grow, but oh, this is changing, changing and things are disappearing, but on the other side, the slow food movement is very powerful. And although I object to a few things of the slow food movement, they are actually protecting and... Uh, but, in the, but in the markets, I mean, people still want their greens and they want the greens that they grew up with, no? Uh, see, but oh, I see these ugly, perfect tomatoes also in Sicily. <laughs> this is becoming a worldwide problem. I see, yeah. the clones. I, see I see I see them and uh, people, I mean, uh, on the contrary, Comparing other countries, people understand the difference over there, so they, they won't like those tomatoes. But if you are in a hurry, you get out of the office at 8 and you have to rush to the supermarket, it's, it's, I mean, it's the same for everyone, unfortunately. You don't have the time to go to the grocery and, and choose the right ones and, and so on. So it is changing also over there. It is. Yes. My, my question was the uh, different holidays. Mm -hmm. You said that yes. that yeah. all over with the different times of the year. Could you mention more? About there that? is a big yeah. holiday on Saint Lucy, mm -hmm. which is the 13 of December. It's again another big feast that uh, marks the changement of season, the beginning of winter, the shortest day of the year. So it's the saint of the light, the sun, and all this. And uh, traditionally, we don't eat uh, meat, and we don't eat ground wheat, so we don't eat flour for that feast. And so there's a huge uh, feast of arancine, whatever you can think of, <laughs> to supply this terrible loss of bread and pasta. And, um, and that's, uh, that's also very interesting. It's, it's a lot of it in Palermo and in Siracusa where the saint, um, parts of the body of the saints are resting because the rest has been stolen in Venice, as I have to say. And, uh, and, then, there are, and then there are many little feasts, uh, San Biagio, San Calogero, Agrigento, and smaller, but they all have a special bread or a special something for that day. And then there's the big Santaga del Catania, which is the only one that doesn't have food. No, they mean any Santaga. No, they mean any Santaga. shocked me the first time. I said, maybe you want to say about something about See, that. this is a, one of the uh, incredible contradictions of Sicily, and I'm actually working on this topic, is that you have these, um, this big product, big, now it's getting smaller and smaller. The nuns in the convents used to survive by doing pastries. This is something you can see, I think, also in Mexico. I mean, it's a Spanish heritage. What the, the, the amazing thing is that the, the pastries made by these nuns have the sexiest name <laughs> in the world. So one is Triumph of Gluttony. The other one is the Tits of the Virgin. <laughs> This is this again. <laughs> uh, two questions. One, you mentioned the slow food movement. Yes. Can you mention how involved it is in Sicily? And the other was the tomato paste yes. in the bottles. Yes. I've never seen that. Can you buy that outside of Sicily? Mm, in, uh, no. No. Uh, you can order it online. <laughs> There's a place that's that's in here in New York. That sells yeah, it. Italy sells one, but it's not seen. It's not that great. And um, no, the um, the slow food. Yes, slow food is important. No question. I mean, they have this uh, web of presidium, and um, and they've done a lot for these. Now, Italy is always a very partisan country, so. 
If you are with slow food, you're against the rest of the world. If you're with the rest of the world, you're against the slow food. So this is always part of our Italian mentality. But besides this, I think slow food did a great job. And if you've been at the Salone del Gusto, this big, big meeting that they do in Turin every two years, with this Terra Madre, which is a part of the meeting where all the people who have rare things on the way of disappearing or with special process gathered together, it's very, very moving and extraordinary, I must say. And they've done this, so no question. This is absolutely a good thing. One more question. Uh, in Sicilia, is there a mozzarella di bufala? No. 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 Only in There's no bufala. <laughs> well, uh, as, uh, as expected, uh, Fabrizio Lanza's conference was inspiring, fun, inviting. Unfortunately, we don't have food to offer, but I want to remind you that we have Fabrizio's books upstairs. She'll be glad to sign them for you, and you can have a sip of wine and also try and go home with some taste of sissy in your mouth. Thank you again very much. <laughs>